Uh, good morning. I would like to welcome all of you to the first Dubai Future Forum. To discuss with you the opportunity, but also the challenges in the future. We live in a very interesting time in a human journey. I believe that we went as human through four, four phases. The first one, when we discover fire. That maybe 5,000 years, we invented the wheel. So we get really closer. Over 3,000 years ago, in a place in Syria, Ogarit, Syria, we invented alphabet, the Ogariti alphabet. We change knowledge, we recorded our knowledge. Today, this is the fourth phase. And this phase just started. We live in the first second of the first minute of the first hour of the first day of the first year when it comes to technology. It is just the beginning. And we haven't seen anything yet. Collectively, as an expert, we're sitting in one place where we exchange knowledge, hoping to design a better future for humanity. My first question to you, Professor Kako, is before I move to the far future, would like to know the near future. What's your prediction? What will happen in the next 10 years? Well, Your Excellency, first let me say that it's a great honor to be here today because I travel around the world. I meet governments, I meet officials, but only in the UAE do I find a government that has a vision. We have visionaries leading the country asking how can science and technology enrich and, and, and educate the people of the world. So I congratulate, I congratulate the leadership, Your Excellency, that has really propelled the whole country into the future. Now, let me say about the next five to 10 years, the internet will be everywhere and nowhere. Even in your contact lens, you simply blink and you will be online. And who were the first people to buy internet contact lenses? College students studying for final examinations. They will blink and see all the answers to my exam right there. And think about it, on a blind date, your, your date says that he's single, he's rich, he's unattached, but your contact lens says, no, nope, he's married, he's a loser, <laughs> he, has, he has three wives to support. So it can be very handy having that. And then for energy, we will have fusion power. In two years' time, in France, there will be an announcement that for the first time we've captured the power of the sun on the earth, that we have break even, that we can create as much energy as we put into it. What's the energy source? Seawater. Seawater, the hydrogen from seawater can be burned in a fusion reactor to give us unlimited energy, energy from the stars on the earth. And then, in your living room, we will have the ability to detect cancer years before a tumor forms. A blood test, a simple blood test is now available commercially to detect 50 types of cancer in your blood. Think about this. In the future, it'll be your saliva. In the future, it'll be your, your toilet, in your bathroom. Your bodily fluids will be analyzed quietly and tell you 
that you will have cancer in five, 10 years. In other words, the word tumor could disappear from our language. We may no longer say tumor anymore. That's how fast biotechnology is moving, that one day we will treat cancer like the common cold. That is, we can't cure it, too many forms of the common cold, too many forms of cancer, but it won't kill anyone in the future. And so we're talking about a bright future where intelligence, the internet is everywhere and nowhere. That's the near future. Take us 50 years down the road. What is your prediction of five things that will take place within the next 50 years that will change human course? Within 50 years, the word digital will disappear from the English language because computers will be part neural. We will, com we will connect the computer to the living brain. So we will have telepathy. We will think, turn on the internet, turn on the lights, move objects, dictate manuscripts mentally. This means that the internet will become brain net. We will telepathically communicate with the people of the world. We will record memories. We will record emotions on the internet. This means that the movies, television, will become obsolete because the movies, television have no emotions, they have no feelings, but that's what the brain net will give you the ability to feel what other people are feeling, to communicate mentally with other people. So in other words, BrainNet is gonna revolutionize the internet. The next level of the internet will be when the human mind is connected to the computer. And then what about the computer itself? The computer itself, the digital computer, will become junk. We will go to quantum computers. I'm a physicist. We physicists know that the quantum theory is what governs the atom. And we will create computers that compute on atoms. These are the ultimate computers. Computers that will make digital computers obsolete. Quantum computers. And what can we do with it? Perhaps cure incurable diseases. Because quantum computers can work at the quantum level at the level of viruses, bacteria, at the level of diseases, and we'll be able to cure Alzheimer's, cure Parkinson's, cure forms of cancer, because these are gonna be at the molecular level. And so we're talking about a whole new era. And then, once we conquer these diseases, there's a possibility of immortality. That is, living beyond our years. Two types of immortality. One is digital immortality, where we are digitized, and that digitized image lives forever. We are doing it now. Every time a teenager makes a stupid prank on the internet, it's recorded forever. It's part of your biography, all the stupid things you did as a child. In the future, all of that will create an avatar that looks like you, talks like you, has your memories, but can talk to your great, 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 great grandchildren. You will live forever on the internet. I would love to talk to Einstein. One day he will be digitized. I would love to sit down and talk to Einstein, find out what he was thinking about for all these years, his dreams, his hopes. One day we, will be digitized. We will talk to our descendants. Realize that when you go back to your family tree, how far does it go back? Maybe two generations. After two generations, your family tree disappears in the sand. Nothing left of them. Now you will live forever in a digitized form as an avatar. And then we will have biological immortality why do we die? We die because of errors. Errors build up in our cells, in our genes, in our hormones. 
These air buildup is why we die. But now with genetic engineering, we can dream of the possibility of correcting these mistakes, correcting the errors that develop in our genome. And that means perhaps extending the human lifespan. So for the first time in history, we can now think about living forever and not be locked up in a lunatic farm. We're talking about immortality as being part of our medical agenda. Interesting, interesting. Uh, let me take you a bit to, you know, these are scenarios that a thing went right. Do you think that thing can be reversed as humanity? We can go backward. You mean a disaster that could happen? I, I, always we are looking that we are moving always with advancements, technology, but there is a scenario that can take us back in time and history. There is always a danger that technology can bite us back. There's always a problem because every time we invent a new invention, like a bow and arrow, a bow and arrow can be used to kill food so that we can eat. But bows and arrows can also be used to kill people. So there's always that danger. But I think that the internet has a moral direction. I disagree with most people. Most people think the internet is neutral, can be used for good or bad. I think the internet has a moral direction because what does the internet bring us? Knowledge, enlightenment, other people's point of view. That means that we can unleash the powers of democracy. People have a voice. They didn't have a voice before. Maybe that voice is corrupted. Maybe people yell too much sometimes, but they have a voice. And that means democracy. Democracy thrives when people have a voice, and that's what the internet brings. So I disagree with people who says that technology is neutral. Yes, technology can be used to kill, but in the larger sweep of history, technology brings empowerment. People who are powerless become empowered in the future, and that is irreversible, an irreversible march of history. So I think that technology brings enlightenment. It brings understanding between people and lessens the fires of war. I think we will always have wars because we will have disagreements. But the intensity, the ferocity of war, I think will be decreased because the internet brings empowerment. Empowerment brings democracy. So you don't think there is a chance of human civilization can go backward? It is possible that we could go backwards because of course we have nuclear weapons, we have designer germs that can wipe out whole populations. We have global warming. Uh, I'm a physicist, and when I was in college, I was offered a job, a job to work at Los Alamos designing hydrogen warheads. So I told my mentors that I prefer not to work on hydrogen warheads because I wanted to work on something even bigger, something even more ferocious than a hydrogen warhead. I wanted to work on the Big Bang, the creation of the universe. And I think the creation of the universe is harmless because it happened 13.8 billion years ago. But the point is that yes, we can go backwards, but I think the march of history is forward. Maybe we agree, both of us, that we are not alone in this universe. Yeah. Well, I when, haven't. When will have the first contact? That's a difficult question. Well, I have the privilege of being able to interact with top scientists. And every time I talk to these scientists, I ask them the question. I ask them the question of all questions. Is there intelligent life on the Earth? And I'm now convinced there's no intelligent life on the earth, except in this room. In this room, we have the most intelligent, far-sighted, caring individuals. 
Yes, there is intelligent life. Just look around and we see intelligence. So do you believe? I believe they're out there. Okay. Whether or not they have visited us, we can debate that. But our galaxy contains 100 billion stars. Just in the galaxy tonight, you can look at it, the Milky Way. And how many galaxies are there? 100 billion galaxies we can see with our telescopes. So how many stars are there? 100 billion times 100 billion. To think that we are the only intelligent species in the world, in the universe, I think is the, the, the ultimate mistake. There's simply too many universes, too many worlds out there. So you, you don't have a time. I don't know when we will make contact, but I think in this century, there is a very good chance that we'll pick up a signal, a signal from another planet. I think in this century, we might be able to pick one up like that. And this century? I think in this century, it may happen. Right. And that could be a tremendous event in human history, because in human history, we've never had that before. The meeting with an intelligent civilization perhaps more advanced than ours. As you know, you know, you know, within our culture, our religion, even Adam came to earth from a different place. So even within this part of the world that people believe that we came from somewhere else to earth. Correct me if I'm right. <laughs> uh, how, I mean, let me move to a different subject. Mm -hmm. We live in cities, villages. How do you see future cities? Well, I think that the cities of today are where the jobs are. Economic activity is what drives people from the countryside into the urban areas, because that's where you get a paycheck. That's where economic activity takes place. But as long as that economic activity is concentrated in such a small area, it means that the population soars, and that creates congestion, pollution, problems, and all sorts of things. So there are several possible solutions to that. One of them is to go underground, to build layers of the cities not on top of each other, but below each other into the soil. That's a possibility. But I think that uh, another possibility is to distribute jobs elsewhere. Jobs do not have to be located in cities. But that's why we have these megalopolis, because that's where, that's where wealth is. That's where economic activity is. But I think we can disperse that so that it's not concentrated in certain areas uh, that are just too dense. You touch base about the internet technology, good. artificial intelligence. We have this two theory. Artificial intelligence is good for humanity. Artificial intelligence will destroy humanity. Where do you stand? Well, we are brainwashed by Hollywood to think that robots are so smart, they can take over very soon. But if you compare a military robot to an animal, what animal would correspond to a military robot? The answer is a cockroach. You put a cockroach in a forest, the cockroach finds food, shelter, mates, creates a home. You take a military robot and put it in the forest, and what do you get? Junk. The robot falls over, tries to scramble, cannot even get up, cannot navigate in a forest where there are no roads. But eventually they will become as smart as a mouse, then as smart as a rat, then as smart as a cat, a dog, and maybe as smart as a monkey. At that point, they're dangerous because monkeys are self-aware. They know they're not humans. Now dogs, dogs are confused. <laughs> dogs think that we are a dog. We're the top dog. They're the underdog. That's why dogs get confused. Monkeys are not confused. Monkeys know they are monkeys. 
At that point, they are potentially dangerous. So at that point, maybe 100 years from now, who knows, we should put a chip in their brain to shut them off if they have murderous thoughts. But then the question is, what happens if they're so smart, they remove that chip maybe 200 years from now? At that point, I don't know, if they become that intelligent, I think maybe we should think about merging with them. Remember, this is way in the future. People will democratically decide and vote whether or not to absorb the technology of our robots and become superhuman. And remember that being superhuman may not be such a bad thing. We can explore the universe, thrive on different planets, create colonies throughout the universe. If we have a superhuman body, if we decide to merge with our creations rather than fight them for dominance. We are gathering next year as a forum here. Three things you want us to do for next year. Uh, say it again. What? Three things you want the forum to do next year. Oh. Your wish list. Well, when I was a young man learning history for the first time, we learned about the sick man of Asia. The sick man of Asia was China and India. Too many poor people, too many mouths to feed. They will always be poor. Wrong. <laughs> what happens when you educate them? When you educate these people, all of a sudden, instead of creating a minus, you create a plus. They create wealth, not consume wealth. And that's what's happening in areas around the world. Education, empowerment of young people reverses the poverty that goes back thousands of years. And then what creates wealth? How do you get wealth? Well, a politician says that wealth comes from taxes. You tax Peter to pay Paul. But that's a zero-sum game. Somebody wins, somebody loses. You talk to an economist, where does wealth come from? And the economist says, print money. But if you print money, eventually money becomes worthless. I say wealth comes from science and technology, from the steam engine, to the light bulb, to the motor, to the dynamo, to nuclear weapons, to the computers of today, all of it was driven by science. And that's what I think the museum should emphasize. Where does wealth come from? It doesn't come from printing money, doesn't come from taxes, it comes from innovation, science, and technology. Thank and you. by the way, let me ask you a question now. Your goals, your goals for the museum of the future. I travel around the world. I never, I never see a museum of the future. This is unique. So what makes you different? What, what are your goals for the museum? Usually, uh, Professor, city build museum for the past. We balance between society, technology, and our region. Our region is living on the past. Religious conflict, ethnic cleansing, refugee, because we go to the past and sectarian war, war as war, been thriving because people didn't go to the future. So what we did here as, as Dubai is building something for the future. We'd like to show people in this part of the world and the world that the future can be bright. But also we want them to have confidence in themselves. People of this part of the world are futurists. You know, I talked of the first elevator in Ugarit, Syria. Change humanity. Move us from face to another face. We are sitting here and we are talking about technology. Technology is based on algorithm. Algorithm was invented at 
Baghdad, House of Wisdom at 8.13. So our mission is creating hope for the future, telling people the future can be bright. But also as a, as, a, as a government, we believe that our role is not, we are not just a government bureaucrat. You know, a person is not a minister or undersecretary. He is a designer for the future. Either we decide, we design a good future or a bad future. The role of government is very important in creating the environment and as a stated, designing the future. I'll give you an example, an American example. Silicon Valley, in a way, is designed somehow by government. You know, in the 50s, during the, you know, the, the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, or the missile program, they started you know, with semiconductors. So company came, government funded, innovation started, then boom. So the role of, of government is very important. The role of government in this part of the world is very important because our role, we believe that we are a beacon of change. Our job is to create something. Something I'm sure that will happen in the future, 100% will happen in the future, is change. So. We are changing our region, hopefully in a better way, we can create entrepreneur. We want people to believe in science. We are only 50 years old as a nation, very young nation. When the country was formed in 1971, barely we had any road. We didn't have university. Number of university graduate in the country, in the whole country of the United Arab Emirates were 45, only 45. But our journey also of a journey of humanity. What human can do in short span of time? From no road, last year we went to Mars. This is the capability of human being, when there is, you have hope, you design a better future, and we move fast forward. That's why I'm saying we live in a very interesting time. So this is not a museum. And we believe that Dubai is the world's largest lab. It's a living lab where we sit together collectively and we say, how do we enhance people's life? But not only technology, it's humanity. And the impact of whatever we do is a long term. This is part of global security. When you look at security, by giving young people in this part of the world hope, you are fighting ISIS or Al-Qaeda or other radical by creating a good role model and example. So this is not a museum. This is designing the future collectively and taking it to the rest of the world. We'll make mistake. We'll have growing pain. But the aim is not ourselves. The aim is the whole world. We live in a world where, as I state, there is, you know, it's changing time. There is social conflict globally. Immigrants are not being welcome in certain part of the world. Religious tension. And in the heart of the Middle East, where the stereotype that you know, people fight, they come and fight here. We are creating an example where you have 200 nationality, all the religion of the world, every single color, ethnicity are living in peace and harmony. So this is not 
a museum of the future. This is designing a better future for humanity. I hope I answered part of your question. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I think we, we, we run out of time. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd like to thank all of you. This is the first of so many future forum. Together we are in it for enhancing humanity, technology part of it, but our stakeholder is 7.8 billion people. That's our stakeholder. I would like to thank all of you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. It's been a great honor, great honor and privilege to, to meet you, your, your Excellency, and members of the royal family. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.